All right, good morning, everyone. Sound like a mic? Is this better? There we go. That sounds good. All right, good morning. Uh, I apologize. As normal, I got talking and whatnot, so. But uh, why don't we go ahead and begin this morning with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning again that we are able to join together to study your word, to worship in a moment, or uh, to worship after, or before, rather, uh, the study. We thank you this morning, Lord, and we ask for your presence. In your name we pray. Amen. Uh, we're going to continue our uh, journey through the book of Jonah. We started a little bit last week, and we will continue again uh, today. But before we do that, let's take a look at that sermon hymn that we will have. I'm uh, fairly certain that you will find this hymn to be familiar. First service people, would you agree with that? Did you, I mean, you all, stop, you all sang out quite strongly. So I got, that's usually my, I mean, not being a musician, that's my indication that you like that hymn. If you, there's good, strong singing, so forth. You've got the various uh, copy or statistical information, I suppose is a good word. Uh, mission and witness for related topics. Again, this uh, hymn is, you know, it's set up to follow along with the readings in the church service, maybe not necessarily the book of Jonah, although I think we can uh, find a little bit of carryover perhaps. Uh, as we talk about Jonah, we're going to talk about this idea that Jonah is a prophet of God, and God wants Jonah to go tell these people over here in Nineveh who he's about, and uh, well, we, there's kind of a tension, kind of a struggle for Jonah to want to do that. And so maybe this is a hymn that Jonah could stand to listen to, you know, to help encourage and help to uh, help him on his way, perhaps. So, maybe there's a small connection. You'll have to tell me if, if uh, you think there is or not. Alright, so, Jonah chapter 1, last week we ended right at probably the part that is most well known to people about the book of Jonah, where he gets thrown over the, over the ship and into the water, and a great fish comes and swallows him, and the storm calms. And so I wanted to, uh, I didn't want to neglect that. I wanted to talk about that a little bit because there's a lot of the emotion, a lot of stuff happening between the lines, if you will, that I want to grab onto. But I'm wondering if maybe there's an opportunity for us to. Uh, relate a little bit. So just to recap here, uh, the verse numbers aren't in the, my reading here, but it's basically starting at verse 11. Then they said to him, what shall we do to you? Remember, these are the sailors talking to Jonah, that the sea may quiet down for us. <laughs> for the sea grew more and more tempestuous. Now remember, earlier in the chapter, the sailors were telling each other to pray out and call out to your God that maybe perhaps the storm will calm, the, calm itself. They also thought that they could haul their cargo into the sea, make the ship lighter, and so maybe it would ride the waves a little bit easier and better. Both things didn't seem to work. And so now they are on to their third option. Three, and we'll see if it's three strikes and you're out or third time's a charm kind of concept. For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. He said to them, this is Jonah, pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Now this word hurl is kind of an interesting word, kind of a, well not kind of, it is an action word, a verb I guess you might call it. Because if we back up a little bit in taking a look at this chapter, we're going to see how Yahweh, or God, tells Jonah to go to Nineveh 
to preach to them that unless you confess and change your ways, the Lord is going to, in a sense, wipe them out, take care of them, judge them, however you want to phrase that, I guess. Well, Jonah didn't want to, for whatever reason. Um, but it's basically just downright sinfulness that he did not listen to the Lord. And instead of going to Nineveh, we read that Jonah went in the opposite direction. Finds himself on the ship sailing across the sea. And now the Lord is going to <coughs> hurl this great wind upon the sea. It's the same vocabulary word as this hurl here. So the Lord hurls this great wind onto the sea. The sailors are going to then hurl their cargo into the sea to try to lighten the load. Same vocabulary word again. Does not work. And so now they are talking to Jonah and they are asking, what should we do? And he says, pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Once again, that same vocabulary word. God's got a plan and no matter, no matter how that seems to work out, God's glory is going to always be satisfied. God, it might take a while. Sometimes us humans, we a little slow on the uptake. But God is always going to be right there to not only tell us what he wants done, but to basically ensure that it gets done. So the sailors are to now pick up Jonah and hurl him into the sea. You've got to imagine that the sailors are kind of caught between this rock and a hard place. Because on one hand, they are about to yell out, man overboard, and they want to help him. That You just don't throw people willingly off or out of the boat, especially in a storm. And then at the second time, or in the, the very next thought, maybe the hard place now, is that they want to live. There's this great storm that is threatening to destroy them. Even these seasoned sailors are scared of this storm. But Jonah tells them, throw me into the sea and the storm will dissipate and quiet down. And so the sailors are in that rock and that hard place. And so maybe this is that first spot where we are able to now kind of think about and relate to this. A moment in time when maybe you felt like you were between a rock and a hard place. How did it make you feel? We're not going to go for any skeletons in the closet here. But uh, that moment, was it a comfortable feeling or not so much? Was it confusing? Was it uh, two good decisions perhaps? If I choose this, then I don't get that. If I choose that, then I don't get this. So maybe it was more of a positive thought process. But we can maybe start to relate to these sailors a little bit. So Jonah says, pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. And so the sailors have a moment of decision to make. They've already proven that they are men who probably have multiple, or beliefs in multiple different gods. And now they have a man telling them, throw me in the sea, guys. The storm will calm. But other than not knowing this guy from Adam, perhaps, they don't know John at all, except that he paid his fare, they got their money, so on and so forth. Why would they believe him? Any thoughts? Why these sailors would believe Jonah that if they do this, the sea will calm, calm itself? I mean, they've never seen this happen before. Might as well, huh? Yeah. That's last resort, 
I mean, if we don't do something, this storm's going to wipe us out. But why not? That little conscious tickling him, perhaps, huh? Well, I don't know, because don't you see here, the storm comes up, and, and God saves him, or something came here that caused the storm, or is it just that he didn't go through? Or well, I mean, the text doesn't really tell us that. What I find quite interesting is that this whole time in chapter 1, Jonah never once calls out to the Lord. Yet these sailors do. These sailors who don't believe in God are calling out to the Lord, or at least they will in here in just a moment. Jonah does not. Yet I wonder if Jonah does have kind of that conscious tickliness himself saying, all right, guys, this is about me. I'm the reason. Yep. Fingers pointing at me. I should actually be going that way. I don't want to go that way, but I should be going that way. This is not your fault. Throw me overboard. I mean, it's speculation and so forth to answer your question. The text really doesn't tell us, but that's where my mind goes in thinking about that. Anybody else got? Yep. They also cast lots, right? And they casted lots, yeah. So. Well, indeed. All throughout the scriptures, you're, you're going to see this concept of casting lots to make that decision. Even on Good Friday, the soldiers cast lots to see who would get Jesus' garment and so forth. Yeah, and, and they basically cast lots to spin the bottle or whatever the game was to help uh, figure it out. Oh, pointing at you, Judah, or Matthias, and so it's you. Amy. So back in that time, uh, they had, there were the Roman gods, the Greek gods, yep. the Egyptian gods. Right. So there were so many gods, and each religion or belief system had their gods that ruled over certain things. Right. You know, there was the farming god and the, the crop god and the cash god and all that kind of stuff. So, and they very much, you know, whatever religion you were, you know, you prayed to whatever god was over that specific thing. Yep. So they were just like, they didn't know, they knew who each other were. They didn't know who he was. So he's, he's the mystery, so he must have been bringing one that Indeed. gives trouble. Yep. Um, and everybody else has already taken care of, of their gods. They've already prayed to their gods. So maybe we'll get lucky and <laughs> maybe you're right. Talk to all the gods. That we're yeah, having. right. Kind of reminds me. I think it's in the book of Acts. Uh, Saint Paul is uh, going around and preaching, and he notices in the one temple that they've got a statue to every known god out there. And just in case, you can see how superstitious these people were. They had the etc. clause. They had a god to the unknown god, or a statue to the unknown god. And Paul basically says, all these other ones, you can just get rid of them. Let me tell you about the unknown god. Maybe Jonah's about to tell them about the unknown god, huh? So, uh, all right. So, the sea will quiet down for you, for I know it is because of me. So, there you go. Jonah knows that it's because of me, that this great tempest has come upon you. <coughs> Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land. So they're in that rock and hard place He's moment. Pay the sea. Do I? They've already got their money out of it. Yeah, they <laughs> might as well give you the money's worth, huh? <laughs> uh, so they tried to get there, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. So you'll to me, that tells me that God still had his fingers playing with them. It's like, oh, you're going to try and roll harder? Okay, well, I'll make the storm blow that much harder for you. And so it didn't work. So therefore, they called out to the Lord. See? They're calling out to God. Oh, Lord, let us not perish for this man's life. 
Lay not on us innocent blood for you, O Lord. I've done as it pleased you. Now, I don't know if I can really call that faith yet, but they're calling out to the Lord. So they picked up Jonah and they hurled him into the sea. There's that hurl word again. And the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. Now, from that moment on, and the, the next line here is the line that we perhaps remember the most about this book, but this is perhaps the last time that we're going to hear from these guys. Now, what does it say about them? And their, I don't know if we can call it a conversion moment, or there's another phrase you'd like to use there. But the last we hear of them, they are basically on their knees praising the Lord. Is there any better way to go out of a story than to be on your knees praising the Lord? I mean, maybe we can find different things. But when it really comes down to it, that's how I want to go out. Right? And so, it's still, I find, quite interesting that in this whole chapter, Jonah recognizes that he's the reason this is all happening. But Jonah doesn't call out to the Lord. He doesn't work to intercede for them. Other than to say that he tells them to throw him into the sea. I mean, that <laughs> it might have been something for them to think about. Maybe they they tried that and they they just didn't it didn't work and it didn't make it into the official text, I suppose. But but that does kind of leave you going, huh? I wonder if they could have tried to actually turn the boat around. Now in, in a sea, just as soon as or especially in a storm, if you actually get the boat turned around very next second, the storm's going to turn you back. Right? And who knows which direction you're going to go, you know? But, uh, so, you know, and thinking theologically again now, uh, anytime you read the scriptures, your mind is going to go theologically, uh, the study of God's teaching. When you think about the idea of confession, And Paula, your phrase there, turning around, is the perfect phrase to start to think about the idea of confession. We've talked about it many times, that in our sin we are walking this way, and in confession and absolution we turn around and we walk toward the Lord. We not only stop doing one thing, but we turn around and go towards the Lord. Did it get darker? Huh? Let me see if I can figure out these buttons here. I don't know if this is going to work or not. Oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Where'd it go? Oh, did it close it? All right, hold on a second. <laughs> Yeah, right? I don't know, maybe, oops, that's not the one I want. Maybe there's a better, quicker way of doing this, but this is. This one? Yeah. Well, that's, that's my study notes for. Uh, now I've got to get down to the. Back. Now I've got to do this one. 
All right. Well, I tried. I messed it up. That's usually what happens. All right, so uh, we could maybe start to take a look at the idea of, of Jonah being thrown into the water, into the sea, as that moment where he turns around. Although there's argument that that analogy doesn't necessarily apply here yet because all even when he, Jonah gets to Nineveh, chapter, I don't know which chapter it's going to be yet, there's only four chapters here in the book of Jonah, but uh, Jonah is still kind of grumbling and being a turkey about it. All right, so, and the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And in one short little sentence, Jonah is eaten by a fish. But stop for a moment and think about that sentence. Is that a sentence that you normally say in everyday language, everyday speech, conversation? Yeah, I was swallowed by a fish. Wait a minute, back up. Say that again. You were swallowed by a fish. I mean, all the movies and stuff call it a whale so forth, but the fact remains that one, he was swallowed by it. Two, he was in it for three days, so it wasn't just like he rested in his mouth and he, they went that way for a while. Three days. What was Jonah thinking when he was thrown overboard, lands in the water, however much time between being in the water and being swallowed, three days of being in the fish, which chapter 2 is going to give us at least that, what he was doing. And then he is spit up or vomited onto the shoreline so that he can now say, now cross this dirty, hot desert and go to Nineveh. What's he thinking? What would you be thinking if you were Jonah? <laughs> right? If I only would have listened. <laughs> How many times in, I mean, we don't maybe not have necessarily a Jonah experience, but how many times do we tell ourselves, I only would have listened the first time? I tell that voice guy all the time. You're right. <laughs> and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days, three nights. Now, in Advent, we talked about the sign of Jonah as Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Jesus was in the tomb three days, three nights. So we start to get that. I mean, Jesus himself makes this connection um, and so forth. And so, in so many ways, this whole, especially if you play that numerology game in the scriptures, and start thinking about the numbers and what that means and how that represents, and you can quickly get off track. But, you know, if you use that gospel handle concept where technically there's absolutely no gospel in this statement, but the idea of three days, three nights kind of makes you start to think about Good Friday and Easter morning, Jesus dying, Jonah sacrificed himself for the sailors, Jesus sacrificed himself for us. You kind of start to, well, not kind of, you do see Christ in all of this. All right. Any questions before we go on to chapter 2? Any thoughts? You know, that, that is an interesting thought. Why did they have to do the work? Why didn't Jonah just take a long walk up a short pier type of thing, huh? Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, right? Maybe they'll say, no, 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 you don't have to do that. We'll, we'll take care of it. And then when they said, yeah, okay. You're like, no. <laughs> now what? <laughs> Maybe he said a couple of words he's not supposed to say in church, right? Uh, you know, th I suppose there's the thought that, you know, he was doing this for them. So maybe it was that, you know, even though Jonah said, hey, guys, I'm the reason this is happening. You need to throw me overboard. Maybe Jonah still was a little bit hesitant. I don't know if you... There's been a couple of times in my life where, you know, the one time I remember I was up in the Minnesota Canadian Boundary Waters on youth group, and we had climbed up this big cliff, and then we were going to jump off the cliff into the, I forget if it was a river or lake below us. Water is plenty deep, so at least that's what the counselors all told us, our teachers. No reason to not believe this, but you get up 30, 40 feet, the idea of jumping off this perfectly safe rock is like, why? And you just kind of, and there was many kids who got there and it's like, nope, I'm not doing this. And they actually backed away. Maybe that was John. He got up to the edge of the cliff to jump and it's like, oh, nope, no, I need a look to help. So he tells the guys, I need help, guys. I got to do this, but I need help. And Throw me overboard. I don't know. That's I think it could be um, like an opportunity for those men to to come closer to their God. You know, like you mentioned earlier, they didn't believe in God. Yeah. And then it, it was like an opportunity too. It was like, oh, now they do. Maybe that's all part of what they need. Well, you know, I think, Paul, once again, you are right on the head of the nail here that, you know, Jonah's main mission was to go to Nineveh. But God was also thinking of this handful of sailors over here. And hey, at the same time, I could get these sailors to believe in me as well. So I know Jonah isn't going to want to go over there. He's going to go this way. So I'll get these sailors to believe in me as well. And so, I mean, ultimately, this text tells me quite clearly that these guys now believe in God. That the God of Jonah is now also the God of these sailors. I mean, the text leaves me with that impression. And when I get to heaven one day, I fully expect to meet these sailors. And I can ask, these, ask them these questions. Hey, why did you have to throw Jonah out? You know, did you guys talk about this? My list is so incredibly long of questions <laughs> I want to ask. So. Right? Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, Jonah had no idea a fish was going to come and eat him. Right? I suppose he was thinking that, you know, either the, the water was go he's going to drown Maybe, maybe some kind of sea animal creature thing would. I mean, I, I suppose the whole gambit of things run through one's mind when you're in this situation. Not that we're ever in that situation, I suppose, but. But, uh, I mean, that's I, that's got to be part of this whole s sentence too. You know, Jonah didn't necessarily know that this fish was coming. And so he's in the water. And maybe for that split second, he's going, okay, now what? Storm seems to be calming. Ship is going that way. I'm still here. Now what? I mean, and then all of a sudden he turns, a, kind of wiggles himself around. And this big fish goes, whoom. It's like, Chapter 2, right? <laughs> and certainly inside the belly of the fish, he would have no idea that it's going to be three days and three nights. And so one also now maybe starts to wonder, 
What's it like inside the belly of a fish? I, mean, I would have supposed that it's going to be dark. But how do you breathe? Jonah probably came out pretty hungry. Imagine not eating for three days. I get hungry not eating for three hours. <laughs> right? So perhaps a lot of different things that kind of makes one's mind go, huh. At least mine goes, huh. Other thoughts, questions? All right, chapter 2. When you're in trouble, pray, right? So Jonah prays. So the Lord is God. He finally figures out, hey, I should be praying. Found the belly of the fish. That's got to be a new one for him. I should, I'm in trouble. I should pray. But I'm from in the belly of a fish right now. And so maybe this whole, while well, this actually happened, he actually got eaten by a belly or eaten by a fish, it perhaps is a way for us to think about maybe our troubles being the, from the inside of a belly of a fish. When there doesn't seem to be any way out, where it is physically slash literally dark, my guess is it probably didn't smell too good in there. I don't know, I've never been in the belly of a fish before. But when troubles happen, could one describe it as maybe not smelling the best? I don't know. So he calls out to the Lord out of my distress. So he's in distress, he calls to the Lord, and he answered me out of the belly of Sheol, I cried. So right off the bat, uh, Jonah doesn't pull any punches. He gives us the issue, but he also gives us the answers. So he called out of distress, and he answered me. Now, my guess is this word, you still see my thing up there? I have to get myself one of those laser dot things. My guess is, in other translations, one might find this word, he capitalized, referring to Yahweh. The idea that out of your distress the Lord answers you is a thought that is accurate, a thought that is we can be confident and reassured about. But when we are in distress, does it feel like the Lord is listening and answering? What do you think? Think back to a moment when you were in distress. Again, no skeletons. But... <coughs> You were praying, praying hard perhaps even, whatever that means. Did it feel like God was answering you, listening to you? Okay, yeah, so when Jonah's going, now what? I'm actually supposed to go to Nineveh, but I'm still sitting here in the water, miles from the shoreline. How am I supposed to get there? Do I have to start with the tall stroke, maybe switch to the back stroke? And God answers him, but it's a fish. Right? And inside the fish, he's probably, is it a stress? He's probably, okay, Lord, I'm in a fish. I mean, <laughs> right? <laughs> My assumption is the fish is going that way. I trust the Lord that it, he's using this fish to get me there. It's a long way if it's even that way. Yeah, he's got ways to go. I mean, text tells us three days and three nights. And, I mean, a fish, you'd probably, he didn't probably have a steering wheel to make him go straight that way. <laughs> Chances are the fish went this way for a while, and he went this way for a while, and maybe went down for a while. And but the idea that he three days, three nights. Out of the belly of Sheol, I cried. Now this word Sheol is probably a word that we have seen numerous times through the scriptures. I think the, the 
study notes had something like 60 some times. The word is a little bit confusing. There really doesn't seem to be an exact one-for-one -one definition of the Hebrew word. So a lot, many times what we have to do to understand this word, like any other word I suppose, is also take context. What is going on to understand this word? All right. So when we do that, we're going to find at least three different thought processes that this word is going to refer to. Um, in various places, Sheol is going to talk about that final resting place. All right. Um, death has happened, and now they're either going to be in hell, that resting place, or maybe even in heaven, depending on the context of what it's saying. A second thought is that it's the realm of the dead, where everybody is going to go, whether they believe in Christ or not. Everybody is going to go that direction. And again, depending on the context of that specific verse, answering the other questions that might arise for us. A third thought, and this seems to be kind of the thought that is this instance is referring to, is that it's referring to God's judgment. God is, and remember, judgment, usually our minds think of right away of being guilty, something bad, something perhaps negative. But judgment can also mean positive or innocent or more that direction. And so uh, out of the belly of judgment, maybe we would could say, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, quite literally. Jonah was cast into the deep into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Quite literally, Jonah is able to say these words. And maybe more, I don't know, would the opposite of literally be figuratively in our way of life? When we feel like we have been <coughs> cast into the deep, do we feel like we are surrounded by a flood that waves are passing over us. There is no way out, maybe. Maybe we feel like our nose is just above the water line and somebody offers us a glass of water. Maybe not so helpful. So, but now remember, back up here, in uh, basically right here that Jonah is acknowledging that the Lord has heard his voice even from the belly of Sheol. Okay? Verse 4, Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. So, he feels like he's been driven away from his sight, but not all is lost. Much like Job will, will echo, or maybe Jonah's echoing Job, however you want to phrase that, Job is going to say, I know that my Redeemer lives. And so even though jo Jonah feels like he's driven away, yet again, I shall look upon your holy temple. Yet again, not all is lost. Yet again, I am going to again see Christ. I am going to again see God, even though I'm in a fish. Still cracks me up. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head at the roots of the mountains. So maybe, 
I don't know, is this a, would this be a description of what it was like in the, inside the fish? Beads wrapped around his head? It's kind of a thought. I'm out of time again. All right, I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever, yet you brought me up, yet you, yet you brought up my life from the pit. There we go. Kind of a tongue twister. Oh, Lord, my God. So, we will, unless you have thoughts or questions, we will pick up with that again next week. All right, let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thanks for coming.